Okay, ladies and gentlemen, if I could ask you to uh, please take a seat so that we can take on, stay on time. I know we're all interested in full participation in the reception. We have a terrific um, afternoon keynote speaker uh, who will talk to us about the power of vaccines. If I could ask for those that are in the room to have a seat and join us, that would be great. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Seth Berkeley um, was appointed Chief Executive Officer of the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization, also known as Gavi, uh, in March of 2011. Um, over the years, Dr. Berkeley has proven himself as a global public health leader who, as founding president and a long-term uh, leader of the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative, um, has brought a, a career of um, a commitment to and success at assuring that vaccines um, receive the kind of high-level political and policy attention that you've heard is so important to successful use and creation, as well as creating essentially a virtual mechanism uh, within IAVI that brought together industry, academics, uh, developing country uh, colleagues um, to really work on the, uh, the development um, and availability of vaccines. Um, the uh, global health community, I know, is extremely excited um, that Seth is now transferring his technical and um, advocacy skills to Gavi. Um, its mission is to make vaccines available for all who need them. And um, as Judy said, we're all interested in hearing how um, they're going to perform miracles. So we have our terrific afternoon keynoter, Seth Barkley. Thanks. Thanks, Joe Ivey, and I'm delighted to uh, talk to all of you. Um, it's a hard thing to, between, to be between now and the reception, and it's also hard to follow a day of amazing speakers. And what I'm going to try to do is take you through a summary of what happened for the day. Now, you'll at the end tell me how well I did since I did these slides before um, I'm giving this talk and heard what you all had to say. So, um, the, the, so the five topics I'm going to talk on are the title, the power of vaccines, equity in the developing world, what, what Gavi does and why it's important, the long-term sustainability challenge, and then future challenges and opportunities. And let me start with the power of vaccines. And you've heard this from a number of people, but here's a timeline looking at the first you know, century plus of vaccine development. And here's what's happened since then. And you can see the crowding on the right side of the of the um, a timeline. And here, if you compress it back, we can look at over time what, what actually has happened, assuming this is going to work, and you can see the dramatic increase we've seen over time in the development of new vaccines. And this is just accelerating from even where we were in the past to where we're going in the future, and we'll come back to that at the end. So we've got a record number of antigens we can use, and obviously the challenge is getting them to people who need them and figuring out how to use them. Um, we've seen unprecedented results in the overall vaccine field. Here's some evidence over 30-odd years of changes in diseases. You're familiar with any of these numbers, but we're talking about 90, 95 percent reductions. And I thought it was quite important, the, 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 sh the slide that we saw from Julie before, on um, you know, this idea that as diseases disappear, people forget about the value of vaccines. And that's something that you know, we're going to come back to. So you've heard about disease eradication here. Of course, I knew Bill was going to be here, and this would be talked about. Um, and, and the importance of how much money has been saved by the eradication effort. And, and you know, of course, you don't see uh, cases of smallpox anymore. You don't see people who remember what this terrible disease was like. Um, one thing that's never talked about in vaccine conferences, which I think is critical, is this amazing second eradication. This is not a human disease, this is an animal disease, but this is the disease that has been around since the Bible. Some say it is the progenitor of measles, that it jumped over from the 11th or 12th century into humans, and this was successfully eradicated. 
Um, obviously not a vaccine preventable disease, but to be complete, guinea worm is something, and Bill said in fact that things are going quite well, and, and this may be the next disease that's going to be eradicated. And then you heard earlier about a polio and measles, the question of whether these two should have been in flipped order or not, but the important point is, at the end of the day, these are two diseases we should ultimately get rid of, and I think it's critical for public health that we do. Now, if you think about you know, the polio eradication program, we talked about the problems earlier, but this is a slide looking, going back from uh, 1988 to 2009, and you can see the enormous progress that's been made. Um, and, and so far this year, you've heard that India is down. There's only one reported case at the beginning of the year. In the last six months, it's been free. So this is a really exciting time. Obviously, many challenges still to do in this effort. Now, what are vaccines doing on the ground? You've heard about them in the West, but really extraordinary things in the developing world. Now, of course, when you start setting up surveillance, you see the uh, disease going up. We all know this from an epidemiologic perspective. Um, but what we've seen is that when you introduce vaccines into these communities, you see dramatic effects. This is looking at Haemophilus influenza type B in Kenya. Here's Haemophilus uh, influenza type B in Uganda. Um, you know, again, a really dramatic effect. Here is rotavirus in Mexico after the introduction of the rotavirus vaccine. Again, a big reduction. And what's interesting is we're beginning to see data from different sites that are actually showing not only is there a reduction in the community getting immunized, but we're beginning to see herd immunity across different age groups. So the powerful public effect of vaccines is being seen. One of the challenges, of course, is how much of these studies should we do in the developing world? And Roger Glass has already asked that question. I'm sure I'll ask it again. But we need to be out there as we're rolling these diseases out, uh, sorry, these vaccines out, we need to go out and understand the effects in the developing world. So taking stock, this is looking at what the immunization gap is. So we've done 82% for the, 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 the common EPI vaccines. Obviously, we'd like to get that as universal as possible. Hepatitis B, I'll show you in a second, has really moved up. But some of the new vaccines that Tachi has talked about in his, in, in his talk, um, pneumococcal and rotor, were still well behind, but I'll tell you where we're going to go to do that. Um, and also important in terms of looking at the effects of vaccines is that there is a literature base, not as strong as in the West, but in the developing world, showing the cost effectiveness of vaccines. This is critical for policymakers to be able to tell the story that it isn't only true in the West, it's also true in their countries. And obviously we'd like to see more of this from the academic community. Now, I was at the NCD conference uh, a couple of weeks ago in New York, and as you know, that's non-communicable diseases, but of course, a little bit, that's a misnomer, because in fact, uh, cancer is considered a non-communicable disease, and so far, we know at least of 18% of overall cancers that are caused by infections. Uh, as an infectious disease epidemiologist, I suspect over time, we're going to find a lot more that are going to be associated with infections, and you've already heard a couple of comments about the two cancer vaccines that are out there that are having an effect, and I loved um, uh, Reno's comments on the life cycle of vaccines and thinking about these types of vaccines that are having effects, effects further out. So, you know, what's happened with the rollout of hepatitis B? We've seen dramatic reductions in hepatitis B carrier prevalence in children before and after across the world. And I was recently reading in The Lancet an article about the stigma that exists in China today with hepatitis B carriage and the dramatic effects that are occurring as the birth cohort has come in and we've seen these huge changes. So more and more hepatitis B is a disease of the elderly in China, not anymore of youth. So let me move after the power of vaccines to the issue of equity in the developing world, which is um, one of the reasons Gavi existed. So if we look at the tradition, so this is hepatitis B. I just talked about the power of it. Started in 1981. I was actually in the original cohort of people receiving vaccines um, in the physician cohort at the beginning. You can see that there was a long delay, a 12-year delay before it moved into low-income countries. Um, we then saw that you know, it took time for it to get up to 50% of the, of, of the West, and then there was a, a, um, a, a six-year delay before 50% of countries uh, put it in in the developing world. The launch of Gavi there we'll come back to in 2000. And then you can see the remarkable effect that occurred, which is actually the immunization rates in the developing world exceeded that um, in, in, in the West. 
Um, if we look at um, Haemophilus influenza type B vaccine, you see the same type of thing. Now, what's changed is that in some of the new vaccines launches that have occurred, um, recently we had a PCV, a, 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 a pneumococcal a 13 vaccine, and within the same year time frame, that was introduced in the north and south. So we've changed dramatically this long lag, and obviously our goal should be, as new life-saving vaccines are made, they should be rolled out in the north and south simultaneously and get to all who need them regardless of where they were born. So looking at ex equity in vaccine access, here's hepatitis B in 2000 in high income countries, and you can see it rose by 2010, but take a look at what happened in the developing world. Sorry, this is a little lagging here. The computer's a little slow, I think, with the graphics. And you can see the enormous difference that occurred after, after that decade in terms of getting into low-income countries. So this is really what we're talking about. Now, why is that important? Well, obviously, the diseases exist there. But here's looking at cervical cancer incidence and, and mortality by country um, income. And you can see in the high-income countries, the incidence rate, the mortality rate, proportionally is much lower. And in the lower and middle-income countries, you have a higher incidence of disease, but you also have a higher mortality rate. So Tony, in his speech this morning, talked about the need to go to places where there was high incidence of disease and have the most dramatic effects. And this is something, obviously, that we'd see with a rollout of an HPV vaccine. Now, here's India, looking at regions across India. And what's important, if the average for India was about 44% fully immunized by 24 months, but the, the range between different states is enormous, between 21% and 81%. And this is important because not only is India a fifth of the world's population, but India is also you know, an amazing country in terms of producing most of the vaccine for the world now. So they're producing it for export, but they're not less necessarily using it locally. And this is something that I know the Indian government and partners are working hard to try to change. So it isn't only by district, it's also by looking at wealth quintiles. And here's going from the poorest on the left to the richest on the right, and you can see rural and urban, and what you can see is a gradual increase as you get richer, more likely to be uh, immunized, but even between urban and rural, there still remains a difference. So going back to Tony Lake's issue of the fifth child, it's going to be important that we pay attention to differences, not only at national level, at district level, but at wealth level, stigma level, et cetera, to make sure we take advantage of these. And if we ask the question, you know, what's happening worldwide, about 19 million children are still missing out from the benefits of immunization, at least using um, un unimmunized with a third dose of DPT. And you can see that India is the largest country in this, in this bucket, 7.1 million, with Nigeria following, Democratic Republic of Congo afterwards, and countries dropping down from there. Most of these are Gavi-eligible countries, um, which we'll talk about. So, so why Gavi? Well, if you think about it, Gavi has a long and rich history. You've heard some of this earlier today from different people. Um, it started out with a, um, you know, the WHO in creating an expanded program on immunization where they began to roll out these vaccines for the world that could save lives. Um, UNICEF announced the child survival revolution. And I would say the most important single thing, I'm prejudiced because I work for them and, and Bill's in the audience, but was the Task Force for Child Survival that brought together the leaders of the major health groups and said, focus on children, focus on getting immunizations out. And that led to um, a, a, a goal of immunization by all by 1990. You all remember that. And um, universal childhood immunization was declared, even if it wasn't quite 90%, maybe it was 88%. But we took our eye off the ball. After that was the creation of a new um, entity called the Children's Vaccine Initiative, which had a very interesting goal, how to create vaccines that were stable, that were appropriate for use in the developing world, bring industry involved in the engagements. Up until that point, industry had been seen kind of outside, and this was to try to bring them in and work with the public sector. And that went for a while, and at the end, didn't quite get the political leadership it needed, had a rough time. And finally, it was replaced by the Gavi Alliance in 2000. So it's not the Gavi Alliance was a new idea. It was something that had a, a strong history before it. And the mission is to save children's lives and protect people's health by increasing access to immunization in poor countries. And four major goals, to accelerate the uptake and use of underused and new vaccines, to contribute to strengthening the capacity of integrated health systems to deliver immunizations, to increase the predictability of global financing and improve the sustainability of national 
financing for immunization, and finally to shape vaccine markets. So I'll talk briefly about these. And it's an unusual alliance in that sitting around the table, but, and this is the board structure, but obviously sitting around the table is representative of what they do, are a range of different constituencies. So there are research and technical health institutes that right now CDC is sitting on, the Gates Foundation, independent individuals whose job is, is to look out for the organization, developing country governments, donor country governments, the key partners, multilateral, civil society, vaccine industry, both from the developed and developing world. So a really different model and way of working where decisions may be a little slow around the board table, but the idea is to bring everybody forward with a shared view of where we need to go. And, and the key partners are UNICEF, WHO, the Gates Foundation, and the World Bank. And the reason I wanted to emphasize this is that Gavi does not have staff in country. So it's working with the partners to implement, and obviously the countries themselves. So it's had a, a pretty big success so far. Over 5 million future deaths have been prevented. You can see uh, the range of these here, but it's very ambitious and wants to do a lot more. And, and what's important is, is there an overlap with where there is disease burden to what it is that you know, Gavi is trying to do. So this is a map looking at pneumococcal disease cases, the best data that we have to date in terms of red being high incidence, orange middle and, and uh, white is low. And here is an overlap of the Gavi eligible countries. So you can get a sense that we almost have a complete overlap of high, high incidence disease and where Gavi is. So, from 2001 to 2011, Gavi tried to roll out pentavalent vaccines, and you can see these are the countries that, that, that qualified for pentavalent support. And um, over um, this time, these are the countries that were approved for it. Um, for pneumococcal, um, this is 2007 to 2011, so this is current time. These are the ones that are, that are qualifying and these are the ones that are now approved. So there's an acceleration, but it's not good enough because when kids aren't getting vaccinated, they're dying. So one of our challenges is how do we accelerate this process and move to get vaccines out as soon as possible? So to date, um, about $5.7 billion has been committed. Um, it doesn't only go towards buying vaccines, it also goes towards immunization service support, injection safety, um, uh, health system strengthening, um, and working with uh, NGOs to try to get immunizations out. So this is an interesting slide, which I took from Bruce Alward, who uh, obviously was on the phone earlier today. And this is looking at polio-funded technical assistance. And they looked at the strength and weaknesses of the broader health system as the requirement for them to go and work in there. And lo and behold, if you look at a map of, 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 of poor and underserved DPT3 coverage, you can see there's almost a complete overlap. So what this points to is the importance of the health system as a driving force in immunization, something we really need to focus on. And so one of these issues is how do we make sure that we get the immunizations out, that we, we increase immunization coverage, but at the same time that what we do is sustainable, it can be used for other issues in the health area. And so we've been working on trying to harmonize health system funding across international agencies. But the challenge, of course, is the places that have the worst health systems are the ones that don't have systems you can easily plug into, and yet those are where the vaccines can make the most uh, difference. So how do we create a system to try to work in, in the poorest and most fragile states? And often the health system for immunization is the entree point for health in general. And you know, you see in many places, you know, a clinic set up under a tree somewhere, and this is the contact with health workers and becomes very important for all kinds of health interventions. So how are we going to sustain this? It's one thing to get them out there, but how is it going to be sustainable? So there are three factors one has to think about. One is, you know, countries getting the vaccines and, and, and how, what they're going to do with them, the price of the vaccines and external resources. And we often confuse these and think of only one of the three as being important, but all cr three relate to each other and are all part of keeping the stool from tipping over. Now, for many of you, this may be old news, but for those that don't, what we'd like to see ultimately is this 
thing called Ramsey pricing. This is a, you know, an economic theory. It's not a real thing, but just to briefly explain it, the idea is that if you, th there is a school of thought that says, let's, let's charge whatever we can for vaccines. The higher the price, the better. Let's make a low vo volume, high cost. And that was the model for many vaccine launches in the past. But if you're able to, instead of have that model, if you're instead able to serve, you know, all countries, you'll make profit on all of the different bars. And so you'll actually maximize your profit. In addition, if you increase your volumes enough and your economies of scale and your cost of goods go down, so this line was to move down, you'll actually increase your profit across all of these, but even in your best markets. So it is within the, you know, the interest, at least in a theoretical sense, to try to open the markets. The real challenge is a political one, which is, is heavy price tiering acceptable politically? It's not, you know, do people want to do it? Is it acceptable politically in the West, which is right now paying these very high prices? So um, this price tiering is, is important. These are three vaccines that Gavi is dealing with, the pentavalent, pneumococcal, and rotavirus. And what you can see here is prices in the U.S. public market. That's not the private market. That's the public market. Private market's much larger. And you can see that Gavi has been able to get from the vaccine industry very competitive prices. And this is critical to long-term sustainability. One thing I want to say, though, is, is that it is critical that we have a healthy vaccine market and not just the lowest prices, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. Um, increased competition reduces vaccine price. This is a, a slide looking at um, pentavalent over time, and you can see when there was a monopoly, the prices really didn't change very much. As new manufacturers began to come in, the price began to drop. Now, this was not aggressive enough, and so we've had a look at what other mechanisms could we do to work with industry to try to figure out um, you know, mechanisms uh, tech transfer, mechanisms of funding, uh, um, expansion of capacity, uh, forward orders, other things to try to drive down prices. And, and one of the reasons that is important is these two X's here are developing country manufacturers who have been delisted from WHO pre-qualification. So these were um, companies who and entered the market at good prices and, and presumably weren't up to the quality standards they needed to be. There was no problem with vaccines from them. But one of the issues in a healthy vaccine market is you want to make sure that your manufacturers in the South have enough money to invest in QA, QC, so that they can you know, keep up the quality that's necessary. Otherwise, we have a crisis of confidence. So we realize that just passively waiting and hoping that a big market is going to drive down the prices is not good enough. And so um, uh, the Gavi Alliance, a number of the partners, including the Gates Foundation, has gotten much more active in trying to do this. And we've seen, sorry, recently um, reductions in prices dramatically down. This occurred around our pledging conference this last June. We saw a 67 percent price reduction on rotavirus. We saw from uh, Julie Gerberding and her team announced a 67 percent reduction offer on HPV. There's also a new entrance of coming in, and then over the longer term, how do we use innovation to drive down prices, whether it's new vaccines, new way of manufacturing, et cetera. And I think you've heard, heard Reno and, and, and talk about some of these earlier in, in, in his talk. So political leadership is critical to doing this. And, and uh, here is at the launch in Pneumococcal, here's the president of Kenya. And it's critical because at the end, we need not the minister of health, we need the Minister of Finance to buy into this. We need to have Ministers of Finance to say that the, I see a lot of heads nodding in the audience, that, that it is really for their health, for their country, critical for them to invest in this. And that's what we need to do. Um, and, and Gavi actually requires all countries to co-finance their vaccines. Now, when countries are poor, um, it's not a big amount of money, but obviously what we're hoping over time is that we'll be able to drive the price down, countries will get richer and be able to afford more of it. And so far, you can see we've raised uh, $31 million co-financing from countries, and, and we're seeing you know, most of our countries now uh, doing co-financing, including some that are doing it from a voluntary point of view. So this is a movement, an advocacy movement we need to do with ministers of finance. And interestingly, this is a complicated chart, I'm not going to go over it, but this is looking at projected vaccine cost as a share of projected public health. And if you just look at the bottom line, which are graduating countries, it turns out that if you were to have those countries pay for the full cost of the vaccines at the prices we've got today, it would be 
0.6% of their government spending on health, which any country can afford. So it is a political will issue. That's not true for the very, very poorest countries, those without functioning governments, the Somalias, the DRCs of the world, et cetera. But um, for um, countries that are graduating out of Gavi, which is a, um, a, 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 a GDP of greater than 1,500, all of them can afford vaccines. So it isn't only important, though, to have leadership at the local level. It's important to have leadership at the global level. Um, here's uh, Ellen Sirleaf Johnson in the middle, who just won the Nobel Prize. And here's the prime minister of uh, the UK, prime minister of Norway, Bill Gates, who is almost a prime minister himself, and, and the uh, secretary of state of the UK, um, who brought at this pledging conference enormous attention to the vaccines and replenished Gavi at $4.3 billion, which allow us to kind of, over the next five years, roll out these vaccines. This type of political leadership is important. It's important to prioritize vaccines, to get the companies engaged, to get political leaders, finance ministers, everybody engaged. Um, it's also important, though, to stretch the donor finance. And that was one of the legs of the stool there. We've just talked about the two others. And so Gavi is working using a whole bunch of different innovative financing mechanisms. The first uh, um, was a mechanism uh, designed by Gordon Brown, um, uh, the former um, uh, uh, chancellor of the Exchequer in the UK. And these are using a bond mechanism to go to the primary markets and, and have bond payments over a long time and front load money for Gavi. Advanced market commitment was a, as a technique to incentivize industry by giving them uh, finance for a product that wasn't yet developed for the developing world and to paying their R&D costs at the beginning, to front-loading their R&D costs. And recently, a new matching fund was set up with the UK and the Gates Foundation where we try to bring in champions from the private sector, other champions, into this immunization effort. So let me just finish with some challenges and opportunities for the future. <clears throat> I could have made a list of 100, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to pick a few. We've heard about um, all of these today in one way or another. Um, um, we're going to talk about data quality, anti-vaccine movement, some of the exciting R&D that's there, the new models um, and the innovation pileup, uh, the fact that new vaccines are expensive, and then this last idea that graduating countries and lower middle income countries uh, may need to be uh, paid attention to. Um, this is an interesting slide, again complicated. It's looking at data in Nigeria, DP3, DP, DTP3. And if you look at 2006 here, this is the survey here showing about 37%. You can see here is the official estimate at about 45%. You can see administrative estimates that are 60 to 70%. Uh, recently, we had a situation where Ethiopia, a country very important to many uh, countries and, and seen to be as a real success, had a, uh, an estimated immunization rate of 86%. A DHS survey, which is a very thorough sur survey, showed 37% immunization. Huge disparities between these numbers. For us to do our job, we've got to have better data, and that data has to be real time. I talked to some of my staff about this, and you know, they, I said, how do you know that the rollouts are going well? They said, well, we wait for the data to appear later. That's not acceptable. So we need to have real-time data. Um, I, I, you heard this at the beginning of today. Tony talked about this, uh, a high-quality, timely data on immunization in developing countries. Um, uh, I, you know, without it, we have uncertainty about vaccine coverage rates, so we need new methodologies. And one issue that hasn't been developed but needs to be developed is the use of biomarkers for validation. You can't use them for routine immunization, but if you go into a place like Ethiopia and say, why is there this, this disparity from 37% to 86%, let's actually go and look what is truth, because that'll help us define and figure out what's going on. Uh, uh, advantage of new IT tools and methodology, real-time data, real-time stock data, cold chain, we talked a lot about that today, and new ways to diagnose disease. Chris Murray and his team out in Washington are working on a lot of different tools. We mentioned the vaccine denialists, um, and I think it's important over on the left here is some of the hist historic ones and, and, and some of the more recent ones. The important issue, this isn't only an issue in the West. This has now been picked up across the world. It's been a problem in India. It's a problem, it was a problem in Nigeria. It's a problem in Indonesia. So it's something that is a worldwide problem and we have to deal with it. Um, and you know, here's an example of a local leader, and I, I, I left local leadership to last, but it's just as important as the other two. 
is talking to the Inmans in the village in northern Nigeria saying, um, you know, th that vaccines are safe, this is important, here's why we have to do it. So um, uh, getting that type of leadership at all levels will be critical to doing this. This is about knowledge, but it's about culture and changing beliefs, and it's something that we have to work as a team to do. No one group can do this. Um, I showed you at the beginning a timeline for vaccines. Here is a timeline going forward, and we don't know exactly when these are going to occur, so don't pick on me on that, but um, you can see here three vaccines from 1980 to 1990, 12 vaccines estimated in the same time period coming up. So how do we deal with this? Our systems in countries are going to be able to take these number of vaccines. Can they financially take it? How do we deal with this, or will there be an innovation pileup? So where's Gavi going with this? Well, at our board meeting in November, we're going to talk about two of these. We're going to talk about HPV, cause of cervical cancer, killing 270,000 women every year, most in the developing world. If we move forward on this, this is going to require new distribution systems. On the other hand, having an adolescent entry point is a really big deal in these countries, because you can do nutrition, you can do safe sex, AIDS avoidance, you can do you know, maternal child health, family planning. It's a great way to get to them. So if you build upon that system, it could be a great public health intervention. Rubella, um, more than 90,000 congenital rubella syndromes in Gavi, Gavi countries. If we do this, we'll do this as MR, as somebody mentioned before, and so we'll help with the measles effort as well. Um, the challenge on this is that you have to do it and do it well, because if you only immunize partially and you get some protection, then you may end up increasing the congenital syndrome if you've got unprotected folks. So this is going to be one that we're going to have to monitor well with better data systems. Japanese encephalitis, there is not yet a, a pre-qualified vaccine, but when there is, this is a regional infection. It's important to a number of countries. Typhoid, um, we're, we're probably going to wait until there's a conjugated typhoid vaccine, but again, you know, important in urban areas. Malaria, we're going to hear results from a phase three trial very shortly. Um, and obviously, there'll be issues on, 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 given the results, what's the cost effectiveness, should this be rolled out, what the recommendations are going to be. And then a whole range of other vaccines that are in development, which we're keeping close watch. And of course, HIV, which I couldn't speak to you without mentioning, um, but is going or undergoing a renaissance, and we hope that that will be something added to this. So, I'm just going to finish with this, this issue um, on, on uh, um, different incomes. I've talked to you mostly about low-income countries, but it turns out that in the poor living in lower-middle-income countries is the largest number of unimmunized uh, children right now. So one of the questions we have to ask from a policy point of view is the industry has been fabulous to give Gavi the cheapest prices, and, and we think that's great. Um, but is there a way we could begin to have this type of price tiering so that we might come to the next income level up with, let's say, Gavi prices plus 10 or 15 percent so that industry gets some additional profit, that those countries can afford it, that they you know, acknowledge the fact that as they get wealthier, they pay more. But can we create a system that isn't you know, the countries that aren't in Gavi have to pay market prices? And um, certainly, we've, we've been very relieved to hear that many of the, co the companies who are supplying Gavi now have agreed to allow their pricing to continue for a period for Gavi graduating countries so they don't hit that cliff. So this is a big idea that needs to happen. So um, lastly, um, you've heard today about the immunization landscape. And you've heard about you know, the measles program, the polio program, traditional vaccines, new vaccines, R&D future vaccines. And one point is I agree with the question early this morning. It's too siloed. So one of the things we're going to try to do, we the community, is can we work better together? Can we have synergies and shared learnings? Are there ways we can use the experience that each other's doing to help lift overall the immunization program as well as health in these countries? That's going to be the view of the future. Um, and I'm just going to finish on um, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates in, in, uh, at Davos. Um, uh, in 2010, uh, announced and said, this is the decade of vaccines. I hope I've convinced you of that by showing you the, the new vaccines that are coming forward, that Reno has convinced you that the science and technology is going to be accelerating. And so our job at the end is going to be to accelerate the pipeline, achieve universal coverage, and finish the job on the cases, the eradications, and the covering with existing vaccines that are so important. So with that, I'll stop, and I'm happy to answer questions.